Hello. Hello. Bonjour. Thank you for being here. Uh, tak. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm honored to monitor this session and I'm honored to be at the Play the Game. It's a first for me and I'm very impressed by this conference. Uh, uh, doping uh, for me is one of the most difficult subjects in sport, in sport law, because it's extremely complex. Uh, it's an extremely complex matter. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's doing with rights of athletes. It's uh, it's a big um, it's a big big uh, exception to to the law because athletes have to renounce to a right. They are deemed uh, they are deemed culpable. How to say culpable in English again? Yeah. They are deemed to be, uh, you know, uh, pardon me? Guilty. Uh, guilty. 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 And they have, they have to prove that they are not. Even the most horrible criminals uh, benefit the right of innocence in law, but actually do not. So it's a very, very complex, if you think about, complex area of law. Uh, and, and the rights are suspended. And nowadays, in, in sport, we have the phenomena of also whistleblowing. And the rights of whistleblowing, and how do we protect them, etc. So for me to be part of here, and to be monitoring these very incredible people who are going to talk to you, is a huge privilege. And I think this panel is going to be of extreme importance and of extreme interest. And uh, we have uh, very, very interesting people that I do follow on social media. Uh, I have uh, the first person who's going to talk is from the country down under and is a celebrity uh, amongst his peers. And his name is Mr. Anderson, and I am a big, big, big fan of him. So I please uh, ask him to come and uh, to talk about his subject and present himself. Thank you. Thanks, um, I think the only reason I'm a celebrity is because I'm the only ginger in the room. I think that's about, <laughs> that's about it, really. <laughs> uh, but thanks for the introduction, Aya. And I'm here to speak about the National Sports Tribunal that we hope to establish in Australia uh, next year. Uh, and I'm going to go through this very, very uh, briefly, a kind of who, what, why, and when of it, and, uh, and talk kind of what we're about to try and achieve here uh, in Australia. Um, Australia has about 25 million people, each and every single one of them are sports mad, and it has about 90 sports governing bodies, all of which could be governed or uh, could apply to the National Sports um, Tribunal. And I suppose the first question that I, I kind of, in this brief presentation, want to talk about is, um, I went to the PowerPoint um, course and work, so that's why uh, I have all the jets here. And um, who am I and why am I interested in this? And um, just a little bit about the background. I am, have been asked by the Australian government to chair the advisory committee that is establishing this National Sports Tribunal. Um, I'm on the International Tennis Federation's Ethics Commission and the IWAF's Disciplinary Tribunal, and I'm on the Integrity uh, Unit of the International Field Hockey uh, Federation. Uh, I was also for three years a member of CAS, um, and I bring that experience, good and bad, hopefully, to trying to establish this national sports um, tribunal. And um, the why is an interesting question. And um, Australia is actually, and don't tell Australians this, but Australia is actually a uh, world leader when it comes to sports integrity, uh, both in anti-doping, which is quite good, 
um, Asada is quite good, and but also with integrity with regards to match fixing. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the states have criminal laws with regards to match fixing, and sports work closely with the police on it. Um, so it's quite good in that. Last year it reviewed its integrity arrangements uh, in a review called the Wood Review. David Howman was part of that review to see what it could do better. And it consulted with a wide range of stakeholders, from participants to sports bodies. And the feedback it got was very interesting. It said, yes, we're very good on policy. We're very good on paper. But for the less well-resourced sports bodies, the vast majority, investigating integrity issues, prosecuting integrity issues, and dispute resolution, we have a capacity gap. And we feel that our sport is falling through that gap. And given the consequences for athletes, this is an important issue for us. And where do we go at the end of our own process? Well, we could go to CAS, and there's an Oceania registry in Sydney. But the interesting feedback is CAS is expensive, not just the deposit, but the security of costs issue. The legal aid issue is underdeveloped. But also, CAS is not user friendly, was the feedback we got, in terms of three out of five decisions not being published. Mm -hmm. And that we have to use specialised sports lawyers, some of whom we'll hear for later, to avail of that. Can we develop a national sports tribunal in a cost-effective, mm -hmm. domestic way to help us? And that's the idea of this national um, sports tribunal, to provide that kind of um, help. Now, the question is, what kind of model will we use? Well, we looked at Sports Resolutions UK, which is quite a good model, a non-for-profit, private organisation. We also looked at New Zealand, a statutory-based one. And we looked at Canada and other, or other countries as well. And we decided, let's have it on a statutory basis. If you have it on a statutory basis, it is accountable under domestic law. It must be compatible with human rights law. And the government can subsidise dispute resolution for sport. I'll give you a very simple example of what one of the aims is that we hope to use the administrative appeals tribunal system to host sports disputes. We don't have to hire that fancy hotel or that chateau. We can do it locally with government organisations. So that's the idea. And we decided to focus on the statutory. Now the question is then, how is it going to operate? Well, we've decided, initially at least, that it will be opt-in. This will not be mandatory. It will be up to us in a two and a half year pilot to prove that we can be useful to assist sports at any level. And then it is up to them to opt-in and sign up to us. We intend to have three divisions, doping, a general division, and an appeals division. And we're open to every type of dispute, except employment disputes, on the grounds that employment disputes are a separate part of domestic law. And for example, in Australia, Fair Work Commission uh, will deal with that. In other words, we are here not to, if you like, supplant the legal system, but to supplement it, and to provide ADR, mediation, and conciliation for sports at the ground level. That's our, our, our idea. And I just want to kind of pick up on three points as we began to establish this. It will commence hopefully next year. We're looking for a CEO at the minute. All applications welcome. <laughs> okay, as long as you're permanent residents of Australia. Um, so that's what we're looking. And um, three points that I just want to pick up on. And um, the appointment procedure of arbitrators. Uh, we are thinking at the minute of not using the class system of one, one, and then an independent chair. We are thinking of using the American Arbitration Association, of giving the parties a choice, because we believe that at its heart, ADR is consensus-based. That's one issue. The publication of awards is an interesting issue, and already we've got feedback from sports bodies that they do not necessarily or automatically want awards published. 
Now, our view is that as effectively a state body, we will be mandated to publish awards, certainly at the appeals level. Mm -hmm. And at a point that will be picked up later, the more we will publish, the more precedent is available, the better it is for the users of the service. And the third point is we do have the power to compel witnesses. And we have significant powers in that regard, which relates to a previous Australian anti-doping case involving a footy club called Essendon. Uh, whereby a uh, sports scientist went rogue within a team environment situation and they couldn't compel him to be a witness in the events. So we have powers in that regard. And the final thing uh, I just want to, to make uh, the point is this. We can get the procedures right, we can get the policies right, but can we get the politics right? There are four or five major sports bodies in Australia who have their own relatively sophisticated tribunal systems, it is unlikely that they will opt in immediately. At the other end, we do, of course, have Olympic sports bodies. And the default for many of their disputes is the Court of Arbitration for Sport. The head of the Australian Olympic Committee is the head of ICAS, and obviously will have a loyalty to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Where do we fit? in offering a service to Australian sport. We have an idea uh, and we hope to go ahead with that next year. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jack. I always find it extremely interesting what happens in Australia as a Canadian because, as you know, in Canada we are a federation as you are and we are part of the Commonwealth. And usually what happens in sport law in Australia, five years later, happens in Canada. So thank you for that. So we will follow that very, very uh, nicely. Uh, our next speakers are going to be attending and they will have 20 minutes, or maybe even 25 minutes. And they are going to talk about the rights and how to protect the rights in litigation in the UK and the USA of uh, athletes in, f in litigation in uh, cases of anti-doping. As I said to you, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, doping is a strict liability. Strict liability is that the athletes are uh, guilty and they have to prove that they were uh, innocent. Okay, the proof is on the athlete's shoulder and that is a very, re really, really, something very rare in law. So I, uh, I ask my colleagues to come here and to talk about that. That, that should be very interesting. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your kind words. I appreciate this. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, as the chair has just suggested, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually present to you uh, a new research project I'm working on, which is basically the introduction of a system of judicial precedent before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, uh, with a subsequent uh, binding effect of its decisions on national anti doping panels. But I have to warn you, this is a joint paper with uh, Howard J. Group, so we're going to actually play into a good cup, a bad cup, and me being the bad cup, obviously. Um, now, some of you may remember me from 2004 uh, when I had the uh, unfortunate situation that I had to defend the two Greek sprinters, Mr. Kinteris and Miss uh, Tanu. As a matter of fact, uh, Richard Pound actually uh, reminded me of that case. I was actually, I saw him walking outside the corridor and uh, he said to me, where do I know you from? Uh, and I responded by saying, well, we used to fight each other against each other over the media about 15 years ago when you were so nasty against my clients. And he said, who were your clients? And I said, well, the Greg Springers from St. Gitaris and Miss Tunnel. And Richard actually ran a lot faster than my clients. I just didn't want to talk about it, obviously. It brought back uh, bad, mem bad memories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually uh, focus on protecting athletes' rights and anti-doping litigation. I'm going to actually concentrate and focus on the decision-making of national anti-doping panels and how such decision-making really affects uh, the rights of individual athletes. 
Uh, we're going to actually have a look at uh, some gas cases and we're going to actually analyze, and I think Howard is going to do that, he's going to analyze the advantages and the challenges perhaps that exist uh, under a system of judicial precedent. Obviously this is a, a, a revolutionary step, uh, it's being uh, discussed at the moment and I am hoping uh, that uh, gas will eventually actually introduce that uh, system. Now, uh, I have defended over the years um, some hundred athletes or so, and uh, usually I get uh, the response from uh, external stakeholders, and they usually ask me, how can you actually defend these people, with emphasis being placed on the words, these people. And to me, this is where the system is actually failing to protect the innocent athletes as the operation of strict liability, as the chair suggested a few minutes ago, creates a very uh, unwelcome presumption of uh, being guilty until proven innocent. And to make things worse, the provisional suspension that usually follows the charge against an athlete also creates a stigma against such athletes. And then the premises, the importance of legal advice to an accused athlete cannot be underestimated, nor can it be dismissed at face value. Now, to effectively and accurately advise an athlete, however, a lawyer needs a legal foundation, a system with a legal, strong legal foundation that promotes predictability uniformity, clarity of legal thought, and also legal certainty. And these are basically the underlying reasons uh, that forced me, and I will actually use a, use a few examples in a minute to actually illustrate those reasons, that forced me to actually propose uh, a system of judicial precedent before uh, the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Now, before I actually move on, move on to actually uh, discuss in more detail how such a system can actually work before the Court for Arbitration for Sport, uh, what I want to do is just explain for those of you who don't have a legal background, or those of you who don't actually work in a common law uh, system, that um, judicial precedent usually operates in a way where judges who sit at lower courts are bound to follow decisions by judges in higher courts. There are obviously some exceptions, and one of them really relates to uh, the judges who sit at the Supreme Court. Uh, at least in the UK, they have the ability to actually depart from their own previous decisions. Uh, the Supreme Court formerly known as the House of Lords in the UK. So at the same time, that creates some sort of flexibility. In essence, the law does not really become rigid and stale, as you can see over there from the disadvantages of, um, of judicial precedent. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that flexibility also allows judges to actually move where they feel that the legal reasoning in a previous case is no longer acceptable, is, not, is no longer uh, valid. And that creates obviously accumulated experience, it creates previous knowledge that can actually be used in future decisions, uh, but more importantly, it creates that legal certainty that advisors are looking when they need to actually advise their clients. And this is the main reason that actually forced me to create that proposal in relation to system of judicial precedent, because currently I believe, and that's my personal humble opinion, that there's no legal certainty, especially in the decision making of uh, national anti-doping panels. And obviously those of you who actually uh, work or deal with national anti-doping panels, you might get upset, but uh, that's something that actually comes out from practice. I'm going to use an example from my private practice in just a few minutes just to illustrate uh, the point. The next question we have to ask basically is as to whether uh, a system of judicial precedent or star decisis as we call it actually exists before the court of arbitration for sport. And the first argument is, and this is a very well established argument, that CAST does not, I emphasize this, CAST does not have a system of judicial precedent but, again, in my humble opinion, silently it does operate one. I will explain how in a minute. As you can see in the second bullet point over there, we do have a CAST award, a CAST decision from 2004, which basically confirms that argument and, and states, and I quote, in CAST jurisprudence, there's no principle of binding precedent or stare decisis. However, the CAST panel will obviously try 
if the evidence permits, to come to the same conclusion on matters of law as a previous CAS panel. And this is really the essence of an effective system of judicial precedence, especially before the Court of Arbitration was formed. And as you can see, I say that silently CAS does have a system of judicial precedent, uh, not a declared one, obviously, as you can see those uh, bullet, by, bullet points under the heading. However, in practice, as you can see, CAS panels constantly refer to previous decisions, and they're very, very reluctant uh, from departing from previous decisions unless there is a good reason for them to do so. Uh, also in practice, CAS panels constantly refer to the elements of consistency, continuity, and, as I mentioned earlier, legal certainty. This is the important aspect there of the system of judicial precedent. Now, uh, why do I believe that there is such a system, not a declared one, obviously, but cast panels do exercise and silence a system of judicial precedent? You can see that many elements of common law systems can be identified in practice and procedure before the court for arbitration was support. And as you can see there, uh, the process usually tends to be very, very adversarial. We have an adversarial system of examination when witnesses are concerned, and also examination of evidence. Um, panels usually uh, go back to previous decisions and they visit the so-called ratio of the sit and die, which is the reason for the decision in a specific case. And also over the years, and I think Jack Anderson is probably better equipped to deal with this, um, we do have a rather large uh, jurisprudence of the Court for Arbitration for Sport and an emerging body of Lex Sportiva, as we call it. And because of that, because we have a large number of cases that have been decided by the Court for Arbitration for Sport, we can safely say uh, that the system of judicial precedent, because of that constant analysis of previous cases, may work before the Court for Arbitration for Sport. Now, to actually prove the point as to why such system is important and why I'm being forced to actually make that proposal, I would like to actually take you one of my, uh, give you an example of one of my uh, private cases uh, in the next slide. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, I would ask you to actually consider the different, or you decide whether they're different or the same circumstances. Uh, for these two uh, athletes. The one on the left is the Bulgarian tennis player Dimitar Kutrovsky, and the one on the right is the British heavyweight champion uh, Dillian White. And next to him, obviously, it's me if you don't recognize me, it's because I usually have more hair on my head. Uh, so I defended Dillian White uh, about six years ago uh, before the uh, National Anti Doping Panel in uh, the UK. And uh, during the uh, closing submissions, I used the award, I used the decision uh, in the case of Dimitar Petrovsky on the left, as you can see. Now, as you can see, both athletes were accused of um, actually using uh, a specified substance, MHA. Uh, they both were able to prove that that specified substance was the result of the use of a contaminated supplement called jag 3 d uh, both of them were able to show to a great extent that there was no enhancement. Uh, Kudrowski on the left did not declare it on the forum, whereas Dillian White on the right did declare it on the forum, the uh, supplement that is. The time of the ejection for both athletes was beneficial, so in essence the panels in both cases were saying that uh, because you used that supplement you did manage to actually um, get some benefit out of it. They both used just hours before the actual competitions they were involved in. Uh, both athletes had no undergoing education whatsoever. In essence, their sport and governing bodies did not really provide them with uh, undergoing education. They produced no internet research whatsoever. And Kutrovsky on the left relied on uh, a store employee to purchase the supplement, whereas Dillian White relied on his agent to actually use uh, the supplement. So look at the difference now. We do have to a very great extent similar fact evidence. In both cases the athletes took very similar steps, if not the same steps, 
And I need to emphasize at this point that the, um, there are two stages when you actually deal with contaminated supplement cases. The first thing is you have to show how the uh, actual bound substance entered into your body. And the second stage is to show that such substance did not really enhance the athlete's performance. And once you've actually satisfied these two stages, then you move on to actually produce a list of different steps the athlete took to ensure that that specific supplement did not really produce enhancement performance and did not really have anything bad in it. So both did exactly the same things so and look at the difference in the actual sentencing. 15 months for Dimitar Kutrovsky, 24 months for Dillian White. And in situations like this, you actually have your client saying to you, why is he getting a lesser sanction than myself? And if you are a legal advisor to people like that, then you find yourself in a very, very difficult predicament, in a very difficult situation whereby you have to explain that the system is flawed. The system is not. Obviously, these two cases were decided before the 2015 WADA code. And obviously, as you know, the 2015 WADA code offers to adjudicating panels some more flexibility than before. But nevertheless, I think this situation still exists. And that's the reason that I decided to actually create this research proposal in relation to um, judicial precedent. And finally, before I actually uh, pass you over to, to Howard, uh, the proposals are actually producing here is for ICAS to uh, declare a system of judicial precedent or stare decisis. Uh, more importantly, and this is what I would like you to make a note of if you may, please, uh, those decisions from CAS need to actually have a binding effect, particularly in national disciplinary panels, and there must be recognition of CAS as the Supreme Court for Sport. I know Jack will probably disagree with me as to the actual uh, independence of the Court for Arbitration for Sport, but this is something that needs to be discussed further, perhaps at a different conference. And as you can see, if there is harmonization of decision making at national level across the globe, then you will uh, achieve uniformity, you will achieve consistency, and you will achieve clarity of legal thought, and eventually will give the legal advisors the legal certainty required so they can actually advise their clients properly. And because I know my time has actually we just round. I'm going to leave it here. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because the I think both of the first two presentations they, they share. There's a common thread that runs through both of them and. And I think what that common thread is, is how can the first instance tribunal process be improved in a way that CAS appeals are going to be less frequent? Um, because as, as Jack said, CAS is expensive. It's, it costs both parties a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. Um, and so, so I think that what, what you're hearing largely is what can we do to improve the first instance process so that there's less CAS appeals. And, and one thing that could be done, as, as Jack said, is to have more you know, professional first instance tribunals that are set up and, and well funded, well thought out, good set of arbitrators. And another, is, as good as Gregory said, and it's an interesting proposal, would be to have uh, actual binding precedent coming from CAS that would be binding on the first instance bodies. Um, and if you have that, I think you can make an argument, a pretty good argument, that it would, it would reduce the number of CAS appeals. I mean, you, you can always have the situation with CAS because you have the de novo review process where somebody can say, I just don't like the result. I'm going to go and I'm going to present the same exact case on the same exact facts and just ask three arbitrators to come to uh, a different conclusion as to like the sanction. And that happens a lot. Uh, but, but I would say the majority of the appeals are because uh, one body or one party, I should say, feels that the first instance tribunal did not properly apply the law to the facts. 
and not just saying we want a we want a complete do over. And and so you know if you had a set of a, a binding precedent on first instance tribunals, I think you you can make a pretty strong argument that it would harmonize to some degree the decisions you're getting at the first instance, which could certainly result in a decrease in, in cast appeals, which I think would be a good thing. I think most people would agree would be a good thing. Um, so, you know, you, you may start by saying, well, why do we need precedent at all? All you have to do is apply the water code to the facts, and it's, it's all laid out. Everything's right there for you in the water code. Uh, but it's not. It's clearly not, and, and the reason it's not is because the WADA code cannot and does not anticipate every factual scenario, scenario, and it doesn't cover, you know, for example, if you have a rule that says, well, under this set of facts, the sanction range can be between a warning and 24 months, it doesn't, and based on the degree of fault of the athlete, it doesn't go further and say, well, how do you decide where within the warning to 24 months a particular case is going to come? And so you, so you have had cast cases that have interpreted that. Chill, just like the prime example of a cast tribunal that was willing to provide guidance that has largely been followed, I think, worldwide as to, you know, in that scenario where, at least Chile, where it was a specified substance and you're looking at a warning to 24 months and, and you know, IFs are saying, well, you know, we keep, a, we keep applying sanctions that we think are according to the rules and it keeps getting appealed and they keep getting reduced or athletes feel the reverse and, and the cast panel in Chile said, uh, really at the request of, of the ITF in that case, we're going to provide you with a roadmap to how you should go about it. And it has been helpful. It's not binding, though. And so the question is, would it be different if it were binding? And, and what, what happens from the fact that it's not binding? You do have some tribunals, first instance tribunals, or particular arbitrators that just say, well, I don't agree with the Chilich decision. I think that, that its analysis is flawed, and I'm just not going to follow it. If it were binding on the first instance tribunals, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, you know, another area with with the current code that you saw that is, if you have an athlete that tests positive for steroid, and the code says in order to avoid a four-year ban and get a two-year ban, the athlete has to prove they did not intentionally violate the anti-doping rules, and so there was this question of can you do that without proving the source? Where if you, if you can't prove where it came from, can you prove that you did not intentionally violate the anti-doping rules? And the first instance tribunals were kind of, depending regionally, were kind of all over the map on that. And ultimately, a couple of past panels came in and said, you can, you can uh, prove lack of intent to violate the, the anti-doping rules without proving source. It's not easy to do. It's a narrow corridor, as they described it. But it, um, it, it provided guidance. Has it been followed by all first instance tribunals? It hasn't, unfortunately. Would it be if it were binding on them? Of course it would. Would that result in less cast appeals? It probably would. Um, so we do have currently with the concept of Lex Sportiva, persuasive authority, whatever you want to call it, I mean, you do have this, this body of, of case law. And, and I, what my experience in doing first instance cases all over the world is, you know, the extent to which first instance tribunals actually look to the Lex Sportiva and apply it varies widely. Um, and, I would say is a, is a broad generalization. Common law countries tend to look at persuasive authority and, and, and try to uh, assess how it affects the facts of a particular case. Civil, civil law countries may be less so. And so you see some first instance tribunals that just say, well, every case is different on the facts, and therefore there is no precedent, and all these cases that you've provided up to us are not particularly helpful. We're just going to apply the code to the facts. But again, the code doesn't address every set of facts. And so if you have cases where they've gone and, and, and actually provided guidance, it would be nice if, if that were followed. If it's binding, it would have to be followed. Um, so um, 
you know, what, what you have currently, I would say, particularly given that you have a number of first instance tribunals that, that I, I would say, use the precedent as persuasive authority. What, I think what you've ended up with is you have kind of local consistency, right? So you have, you know, the U.S. first instance tribunals are going to primarily rely on U.S. first instance cases. In the U.K., they're going to look at the NADP cases. In Australia, they're looking at Australia cases. And so, so you have kind of this local consistency, but you may not have worldwide <coughs> consistency. So you can have divergences on issues, or you can have, if, you, if somebody does a deep dive in the first instance tribunals, you, I think you would see that in certain parts of the world, on a certain fact pattern, like the, the Jack 3D example that Gregory put up there, um, you're just going to get a longer sanction. Uh, there's like a bias for a longer sanction in certain parts of the world than there are in others. What's the problem with that? It leads to more appeals. There's less certainty, and it's going to lead to more situations where an athlete will say, hey, how come this guy got 15 months and I got 24 months? Let's appeal it. Or the flip side would be you could have WADA say, well, why did this guy get 15 months and this guy got 24, so I'm going to appeal the 15 months. And so they, they just all end up at CAS, and, and that's not a, a great solution for anybody. So, so, so the, the idea of having a, a binding set of precedent that would be binding on the first instance, I think, would, would go a, a fair way towards harmonizing. And, and if, you, if you go back to kind of the very first concept of the WADA code, why do we even have a WADA code? It's harmonization, right? It's so that two people that have the same, roughly same factual scenario are going to get the same sanction regardless of sport, regardless of where they are. And a, and a set of binding judicial precedent would certainly help with that. What are, what are the challenges with it in the 45 seconds that I have left? Uh, I think one challenge would be cast panels would have to be willing to really step up and, and, and view their role differently. You know, if, if you look at, I would say, 90% of CAS appeal anti-doping decisions, they're very formulaic, right? They're 40 pages long, and they list the parties, and then they list uh, the arguments of each party, and then they list the jurisdiction, and then applicable law, and then there's two pages of analysis, and then there's the decision. If, if, if CAS panels viewed their role differently as providing guidance to first instance tribunals, I think they would have to go about that task differently. Um, and, and I guess I'll leave it at that for now and we can discuss it later. I, I have to say something that I'm impressed. I have a, a, a currently a PhD student working on that. That's a PhD subject. Uh, and, you know, uh, and I think those questions regarding doping are going to be uh, going to be more difficult first before gain, getting simpler. Because now we are talking about, and I'm happy that you talked about civil jurisdiction. And because civil jurisdiction are, do not have the mentality of case law and uh, jurisprudence, and also you were talking about um, the the fact that you know first uh, tribunals, uh, you know, but are we talking about tribunals or are we talking about arbitration, you know? And that's also something very, and also you know, in in, in Germany we have the Pechstein case, and where we have uh, more and more uh, uh, athletes are going to uh, say, no, we don't want arbitration. We want to go to real tribunals. So the role, the role of CAS, the, the role of CAS is more and more challenged. And CAS, just as a tribunal, uh, uh, arbitration of expert is also challenged. So that's the future. That's the future, I think, of, of doping and of uh, litigation is going to be more and more difficult, I think, before everything is going to be simpler. So now we will have uh, the tool of how to recognize doping. One of the tools is a whistleblowing. And uh, all the challenges of that, uh, we will, I think, have a very interesting uh, presentation coming.
please. I will let you present yourself. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to kind of change subjects. Still on Dopey, but I'm not a lawyer, and we're not talking about the law in this instance. Um, we're going to talk about whistleblowing. So I kind of realized I didn't set this up very well in my slides. But um, first of all, just to clarify, so I was at Leeds back at university uh, up until May. In May, I started at USA Cycling as a safe sport director and anti-doping lead. Um, so this research was conducted when I was at Leeds Beckett, um, but it's still kind of ongoing. And we just submitted the final report to WADA two weeks ago, um, and it'll be published and go live on their website soon. We're just kind of figuring out how to do it because it was really long. Um, so the project involved five different phases, uh, five separate projects, five separate research studies that at the end we brought together as evidence-based recommendations for protecting and empowering whistleblowers within the anti-doping movement. So I'm going to present the third study, and my colleague Lori is going to present the fourth study. Um, and it's 10 minutes, so we'll see how it goes. Um, just to give you kind of a little bit of background, I did my PhD. One of the papers that came out of my PhD was looking at whistleblowing. And so uh, we kind of, it came out at a time, and obviously whistleblowing has become very topical in the anti-doping movement. We identified as one of, if not the most effective uh, tools that we have now to expose and uh, address doping. And so we kind of, after that paper came out, decided we wanted to look into this more because the reality is we don't have that much evidence. We have people such as uh, the Stepanovs who are here with us this week uh, who can give us their actual experiences, but those are two individuals um, who have had a, a very powerful experience for us to learn from, but certainly there's other stories out there. And if we want to actually protect, protect and provide policies and procedures that are effective, we need to have more evidence of what this process is like in different places and from different perspectives. And so that was kind of the idea behind this five-phase project. Um, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is the research that we did with international level coaches and athletes. Um, and so I interviewed, and for the sake of the 10 minutes, I'm not going to really give you any of the methods, other than what you see here, which is that there was 10 coaches involved and there were 17 athletes involved. There's five phases, so I get them all mixed up now. Um, they were from the US and the UK, and they were all international level. So some of them have retired, some of them were still active, uh, but essentially the interviews were just getting their, their attitudes and perceptions of whistleblowing. Why would they do it? Why wouldn't they do it? What did they even know about it? What was their level of knowledge and experience in this space? Uh, and it was very much exploratory of like, let's just ask questions and have a conversation about this. Uh, it represented a number of different sports, which you can see here, and yeah, as I said, it was very much just a conversation. What came out of this was, this picture is um, from my, the first paper that I did looking at whistleblowing, and what we found in that, so that first research was specifically with student athletes, and it's been published, and I'd be happy to share it with you, but one of the criticisms that we got from reviewers, because that's what you get from reviewers, uh, was, well, this is student athletes, so obviously it would be different if it was at the elite level. Uh, what we found is that's not the case, because what came out of that first research was the indication that student athletes were reluctant to blow the whistle on doping because they were concerned about the relationships with, that they potentially had with that person that we were discussing. So if someone was a doper and they had a relation, if someone had doped and they had a relationship with that person, they were reluctant about the idea of blowing the whistle on them because they were concerned about relational implications. But again, this was student athletes, and so it was kind of presumed that that wouldn't be the case at, at the more elite level. But what we found in this research is actually there were really similar concerns. Um, the quote that you see here just kind of I think exemplifies the complexity of whistleblowing. Again, we know this is a really effective tool, but we often, I think, undervalue how complex and scary it can be. So Barb, who was a US athlete, said in talking about what whistleblowing on doping would be like, it's the same thing like reporting a crime. If you know someone is going to go to jail, or perhaps some major consequences, you just don't want to inflict that kind of pain and damage on a person's future. But at the same time, it's the right thing to do. I would feel a little bit bad personally, but I also know deep down that it would be the best thing to do for the sport and the other people that we compete against. And so there was, this essentially is a repeat of what we were finding with the student athletes, is this idea of like, I know I should do this, and for the greater good of sport, I need to report this, but at the same time, I'm really uncomfortable with the idea 
of being the reason that this person's career potentially ends. And so we're starting to see now kind of this repetition of this concern amongst this elite level group of athletes and coaches. Um, this is just a, a reference to the paper that I was mentioning. So that was with US and UK student athletes. And as I mentioned, one of the biggest concerns was relational. And so what we found, or what, what came out of the research that we're doing now, is again, we're seeing these relational concerns. So Megan was a US athlete, and in asking her about whether or not she would report someone for doping, she said she had actually had an experience where she witnessed what she thought was someone doping, but it was someone she didn't have a personal relationship with. And so as soon as she noticed it, she immediately reported it um, to an anti-doping tip line. But after she was telling me that story, she quickly followed up by saying, my best friend is also a good pro. If I had gone to her house and seen the same products, I think I would have had a real moral dilemma because I would have wanted to report it, but knowing I could potentially ruin my friend's life by doing so, I honestly don't know what I would have done in that scenario. If I actually like the person, it makes me really, it makes me feel really bad to say it. So again, this is now at the elite level of sport and someone saying, you know, when it was someone that I didn't know and didn't have a relationship with, it was automatic. I saw it, I had concerns, I reported it. But actually, had that have been my friend, I really would have struggled with taking that same approach of automatically reporting it. And what was interesting was, so this research that we've just done was also the first research that looked at the issue of whistleblowing with coaches. And what we noticed with coaches is that they had a really similar concern. Um, so they talked, here's one of the coaches that, again, in asking them if he would report doping, he said, I mean, I would feel a responsibility to an individual athlete because somebody has, if they have a violation, not somebody that's in trouble. And I have a responsibility to them. So it's not that I'm going to cover up something for them, but I'm going to give them the best support that I can under the circumstances, even if they're being an idiot. So again, it's this idea of like, I'm not okay with the doping and I know that there's an obligation to report this, but at the same time, and even almost especially for coaches, there was this sense of like, but part of my job as a coach is to protect them, to look out for them and to make sure that they're okay. And so if they were to dope and get caught, like I can't just automatically, or I don't necessarily feel comfortable with automatically turning around and reporting that. Uh, and one of the things that came out of this was there was an indication from both coaches and athletes, and again, this was kind of reinforcing what had come out of our first study, their first point of contact or their first action in most situations was they anticipated having a conversation with that person, confronting them directly and essentially saying, look, I know what you did, it's got to stop, you either need to turn yourself in or I'm going to have to take the next step and do it. And so. As our first paper found, confrontation came through as a potential alternative to whistleblowing. Not to say that those that would be willing to report shouldn't, because that's obviously what we want them to do, but the reality is not everyone's going to blow the whistle on wrongdoing, whether or not it's doping or anything else. So we can either keep telling them to do it, and, they're not, and they don't, or we can recognize that they're telling us, hey, we would actually be more comfortable confronting them. And at the end of the day, if that stops the doping, yeah, it might not result in an anti-doping rule violation, but it stops the doping and ultimately that's what we're trying to get to. Um, so that was for the first time now we're seeing that at the elite level as well. The other thing that came out of the research was specific things that we can do to enable whistleblowing. So what is it that would encourage and enable more people to come forward and report doping on sport or doping in sport? And there were four key things that kind of themes that came out of that, which you can see here. Um, so I'll just give you kind of one quote from each of them. Uh, if you look at the report, you'll get a lot more in-depth and a lot more quotes on all of them. Uh, but these were the four that really came through. And the first one was possibly kind of surprising, uh, maybe not as surprising to me because I've been working in this field for a while. But in general, there is a major lack of understanding of what whistleblowing is and how to do it and where to do it. And again, we're talking about elite level coaches and athletes at this point. So in these conversations, I constantly got one of the really interesting things was that they would say things like, it would be so cool or so helpful if there was like a phone number we could call, or if there was a website that we could go to and report this. Uh, and at the end of every interview, I gave them a list of all the existing whistleblowing platforms, and the majority of them were like, wow, like this would have been so helpful to know, or I never knew this stuff existed. And again, these, these are our like, elite level athletes and coaches. Um, so this is just one of the quotes kind of highlighting that. So uh, Gina said, that kind of thing, like having something that's like, speak out and play clean. That kind of thing is exactly what, I think if people are aware that these things existed, then it would be much more likely that they would do it. 
And a couple of these athletes even talked about how like at international events, they got sat down and told like, hey, make sure you report doping. And then they would say to me, but they never said where to do it. You know, you need to report, you need to whistleblow, but they never tell us actually how to do it. And so just really basic knowledge of where they can report. You know, if I'm, not, if I'm at an international event and I'm a US athlete in track and field in Canada, and I suspect doping. Do I report to USADA? Do I report to US Track and Field? Do I report to the WIAF? Do I report to the Canadian CCES? Do I report to WADA? And if they don't have an answer, they probably won't do it because that's just too much to decide and it's an emotive issue. Um, so the first thing was just basic knowledge. And again, this was across coaches and athletes. Um, the next thing was um, just guidance on, well, okay. I'll go with it this way. They want to know where it's successful. What has come out of reports? So when somebody blows the whistle, what do we do with that? Um, and so Steve said, they need to say, hey, look, so-and-so's, when you announce that you can go on National Anti-Doping uh, Organization's page and see all the latest bans, and they say, hey, you know what? This person got banned because of an anonymous tip. This person received a four-year sus suspension because of an anonymous tip. Instead, they just say, this person received, but why? Tell us that, you tell us that they got tested, but why did they get tested? Because of an anonymous tip. And I think this is one that could be really helpful. We don't talk a lot about the sanctions. Like, obviously, this week, there's been a huge one um, with the Salazar case, and we have a, a really strong example of where there's been a sanction based on a whistleblower's tip. But more often than not, we don't ever find out why a sanction occurred and if perhaps it was in part by an anonymous tip. And so there's opportunities there, you know, on, on Anato's website when it says so-and-so sanction. Could there be an asterisk that says, you know, underneath this sanction happened thanks in part to an anonymous tip that was received? That doesn't give away any information about somebody, it doesn't break confidentiality, but it gives you an indication of, hey, something actually might come from me reporting this tip. And so maybe it's actually worth the hassle or the effort that it would take. Um, so we kind of name this as just like celebrating success stories, helping people recognize that actually things do happen as a result of whistleblowing and so it's worthwhile. And the other one was, another thing that came out is that they want to have someone to talk to. So again, a lot of them, first of all, don't even know how they can blow the whistle, so that's not super helpful. But when they're, one of the questions I asked them was, like, in your ideal world, how would you want a whistle blow? And there wasn't really a necessary, necessarily an indication of like, oh, definitely by email or definitely by phone. There was quite a range, and a lot of it was personality, kind of based on that person's personality. But the one thing that did consistently come through is they want a person. So if I call a phone, I don't want to get an answering machine, I want a person's voice. Uh, if I send an email, I don't want to get a robotic response. I want someone to email me back and acknowledge that they received it. Uh, if I go into an office, I want to have a specific person that I'm talking to. I don't want to have seven different people that potentially I could talk to. Uh, they want to know who that person is. And ideally, they want to actually know the person. But worst case scenario, they want to have a human being that they can have that conversation with. And I, again, I think that goes back to the emotive side of this. Like, this is a really emotive thing, especially for people at the elite level, when they're thinking about potentially implicating you know, people that they have relationships with or that have power over them or whatever it may be. They want to make sure that they're not just going to give you a snippet and it goes away. They want to be able to actually talk through what they've experienced and what they're coming to you with. So that was another really important one. Uh, and then the final one was that they want to have long-term support. Um, so one of the things that came through is that at the moment we focus a lot on making sure that like the process up to whistleblowing and like the actual act of doing it is supported, but it's recognizing that for a lot of these people it's, it's a lot of emotional kind of lead up to get to the point of whistleblowing and it doesn't just end there. Like as soon as they send that email or make that call or have that conversation, it's not like, okay, I'm done, like life goes on. For most of them, there's a really long process of either being involved <laughs> of either being involved in kind of the investigation or just sitting around and waiting to find out what's happening and getting an update. And so one of the things that came out was kind of things like having psychological support for maybe those bigger cases where they are going to be involved in a long-term investigation or potentially hearings and things like that. Do they get any independent kind of external support in that process? Is some, you know, some of them were saying to me, like, I wish someone, because we also talked to whistleblowers, I wish someone would have come check out my house to make sure I'm okay. Like you kind of just end up in the position where you're by yourself and there's this feeling of like nobody cares anymore. 
And so making sure that they have that support. And so again, this was something that coaches and athletes said. Um, Blake in the UK said, a person would normally only report if they were really emotionally involved in the circumstances because it's a lot easier not to do it. And I think that's a really important point. Like, we need to remember that it's easier not to go slow. And so anything we can do to help kind of flip that over is, is something we want to do. He went on to say a genuine whistleblower who genuinely would have gone through quite a bit of emotional turmoil to get to the stage of where then probably would have gone make the call. It's not suffi sufficient simply to say, thank you very much, we'll deal with it. It's not like you're ringing up and saying, you realize the bus is late, thank you very much, and not go to the bus stop until 10 minutes later. It's like, seriously? So I would think that there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement that this is a tough thing to do, and there's some sort of actions that support that person for a period of time in an appropriate way. And I've been asked by multiple organizations, you know, like, what is that period of time, or what is that level of support? It's going to be different, but it's just having that there as, as something that they know up front, so that if and when they find themselves in a situation where they need that support, they're not left scrambling to try to find that on their own. So in the report, we kind of summarize it up as this. So if we want, ultimately we want to enable whistleblowing on doping and sport, if we could focus on just four things that would increase engagement, uh, both at the coach and athlete level, these are the four that we really nailed it down to. And there were a lot, so it took a long time to kind of narrow it down to these, but we recognize you've got to start somewhere, and if we give you 20, chances are you're going to do none of them. So if we could give you four, it would be these. Providing education, giving them that information so that they know exactly where to go, and it's very simple, and it could be an automatic action. Um, making sure that they have people that they can talk to and go to for support, and that are going to stand by their side and let them know that they're not going through this alone. Uh, and then making sure that that support doesn't end, let's say, if they get to the point of deciding to report, but they actually are going to have continuous support up until the point in which they no longer need it. Uh, and then I think one that we could all be doing really quickly would be to communicate and promote successful whistleblowing stories. And that isn't necessarily an Alberta style as our situation. It could be something as simple as, hey, this person reported, we have reason to believe um, that there was something going on and we conducted a test. For a lot of them, that would be a successful whistleblowing situation. Um, so yeah, those would be the kind of four enablers that uh, we're certainly gonna look into more uh, and hopefully look at that within broader groups. Um, but I appreciate that that was very fast in 10 minutes and one study of five. Uh, so certainly happy to talk about it more or give more insights and, and more details on any of that over the course of the next few days. Thank you, Kisley. I find it fascinating. I, I personally had a question, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe later. Uh, it's uh, maybe, I don't know if you have a sport uh, socio sociologue here in the, in the room. Uh, because I had that discussion with, um, with some French people, and I don't know if this is cultural. In France, maybe because of the war, etc., being a whistleblower is extremely taboo. It's like you don't even say it, you know, it's like you don't just don't do it. And I appreciate in America, you, you didn't go to, not so. So I was wondering if, uh, if you had ideas about that, or uh, um, I don't know. Do you want me to answer now or later? Uh, maybe later, or, uh, but I find that very interesting, extremely interesting. Thank you very much. So um, I invite our second, uh, um, was a more maybe European um, point of view from the UK. And again, on whistleblowing, please, please come. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is Vance. Do, 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 do. do I have to do it myself? Is that the problem? I think so. Oh no, I don't think I can. Could I have my slides, please? <laughs> yeah. You're trying to pull it out. Thanks. Okay, so um, hopefully my job's a little easier because Kelsey already kind of teed me up. We are working on this five-phase project 
And this phase actually followed uh, directly after the interview, so that hence why Kelsey and I are presenting in, in this order. So on the back of identifying some of the factors that coaches and athletes said may enable them to whistle blow, we wanted to broaden the sample. So obviously Kelsey said to you that we spoke to 10 coaches and 17 athletes. Now, we value that very highly because we value qualitative research, but we understand that sometimes organisations would like a more representative sample and obviously some quantitative data to complement those rich insights. So we developed a survey to obviously go back to the sample in the UK and the US and to try to explore if those enablers that we identified through the interviews existed in that broader sample. Okay. I don't know if my clicker's working. Where do I point it? I just pointed at that. <laughs> Where? There? Where? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's turned on. I wonder if the battery went. I'm not having a, a lot of luck here. <laughs> Definitely on. Oh, thanks. Do you want to? Oh, thanks. Marcus <laughs> assistant. I feel really privileged. Okay, so this time the sample was 301 athletes and 139 coaches. Now we're claiming the sample was from the US and the UK, but just by looking at the numbers up there, you can see that the UK were not overly engaged with this research project. Mm -hmm. And there's not really enough time to talk about that today, but it is something that we found really fascinating, so please come speak to us about that in the future. <laughs> this is gonna be challenging. We can just tell you to press the arrow. Maybe not. Oh, this one's not working. Yeah, I think so. I think she's trying to press it. I think, yeah, I don't want to interfere. I think she's doing it. It's her fault. It's Call them back. Oh. Okay, so the final survey had 53 items, so they're essentially statements that we put together and ask the coaches and athletes to rate them on a scale of one, which would be strongly disagree, to five, which would be strongly agree. So most of the data that I present here is a, a combination of the agree and strongly agree statements, okay? So, could you, yes, perfect. Um, so we based the um, scale or survey largely on the information we had from the interviews, but we also wanted to underpin the scale with a theory, so a theory of behavior change in particular. The theory that we drew from is um, one that brings together lots of other theories. So the really good thing about it is it's kind of all-encompassing, so it's really broad in the coverage of the factors that it would account for. And what it states is that any behaviour, so in this instance whistleblowing or reporting dopamine sport, would be influenced and enabled if people had the capability, the opportunity and the motivation. Now capability can be physical and psychological. Opportunity can be physical and social, and motivation can be automatic and reflective. And if we, could you click for me please? If we break that down into a smaller number of factors, we can basically see the complexity of behaviour. So, for instance, our capability would be influenced by knowledge, memory, our ability to make decisions, skills and behavioural regulation. Um, you know, and for instance, the motivation in particular is a really complex issue and this idea of having reflective and automatic motivation really comes down to this conflict between thinking with the head, which is reflective, and thinking with the heart, which is more automatic, habitual and emotional. Um, so this is the really strong um, underpinning to the, to the surveys that we got this um, kind of comprehensive overview of factors that we were trying to explore. Could you click for me please? Thanks. So if I get straight into the findings, when we came to capability, we were obviously primarily looking at knowledge, especially because the interviews, as Kelsey said, showed that there were some deficits in knowledge, and they were quite surprising. 
So we wanted to know if those deficits in knowledge that were reported in the interviews actually existed more broadly amongst coaches and athletes, or if we just happened to stumble across a group of people who didn't know. Um, and what we found was that in an enabling way, so the positives of the situation were that just over 70% did know their responsibilities. So they knew that there was an expectation for them to report, which Kelsey said, you know, they had been told. Um, coaches in particular, that's where the C comes from, they knew what to report and they knew how to report. But if you look over to the kind of factors that are influencing in both directions, so for, fun, for some individuals they're an enabler, but for some individuals they're a barrier, athletes had less knowledge. So athletes had less knowledge of what to report and how to report. And if you think the athletes are there on the ground in the peer group, they're the ones more likely to report because they're the ones more likely to know something's going on. So that's a real issue for us. And interestingly, um, the athletes and coaches also didn't know what safeguards were in place. So obviously, Kelsey already said that's a real concern, is that they're worried. Like, if you're a whistleblower, you know there are potentially going to be some repercussions. And if you don't know how you'll be protected, then you're less likely to obviously engage in whistleblowing behaviours. Thank you. Um, some of the good things were that they did have some awareness of whistleblowing channels. So if we talk about opportunity, we're talking about resources. In the physical environment, we're talking about something being out there. Um, tools, apps, uh, phone lines, that kind of thing. And 65 to 75% had an awareness of their existence. Um, but if we're thinking we're kind of selling that as a positive, there's also kind of 40% that maybe don't know. Um, and in the mixed sense, we had... Um, a really interesting conflict in terms of there not being any encouragement to use the channels. So in the sporting environment, I use this now. No. Um, they're not being encouraged. So around kind of half the athletes and coaches said they don't think they're being actively encouraged to whistle blow within their sport, even though their sport or their their, their country, their national uh, anti doping agency has gone to the effort of creating a channel for them to do so. And one of the really interesting things, and I don't think you'll be surprised by this, is that around 20 to 30 percent of athletes and coaches were worried about the reaction. So reaction within sport was one thing, but also a public reaction uh, if they became a whistleblower. And I think that um, it's good to see at this conference there's some uh, media-based sessions, because I think probably the public re reaction is very closely tied to the way that the media deal with whistleblowers. Um, so, let me see. And tied to this, or I suppose supporting this finding, was that lots of the, well, the majority, the large majority of coaches and athletes called for certain protections. And uh, Kelsey already spoke to a little bit of this in her interview study, but 90% wanted protection in some way or form from retaliation. 85% wanted some legal advice or support throughout the whistleblower process. Others wanted media training to obviously handle that whole scenario when it blows up. And 50 to 60% would like aftercare for reporters. So they want that support. As Kelsey said, it's not just a case of them submitting a report on a website and then their job is done. They really need to be um, provided with some kind of um, mechanisms or support throughout the whole process of whistleblowing, however long it might last. Thank you. Um, but they wanted also, from a practical perspective, multiple channels, lots of different ways to report, um, depending on the circumstances. A step-by-step -step guide, if possible, and that would obviously help with them knowing what to report and how to report and also they would like ongoing communication with the organisation they report to. So as Kelsey said, you know, they understand that the confidentiality cannot be breached, but if they just literally know something's happened, so, uh, you know, a test was conducted, they'll feel like they've had kind of what they need to know that it was worthwhile. Okay, so now from a positive stance, we've got some enablers happening in the, the social space. So even though people are worried about the reaction they may receive from their sport or the public, they actually feel really confident in the support they'll receive from their closest people. So this might be family, it might be friends, we didn't specify, but we just said someone important to you. And strongly, they believe that the people who are important to them will A, encourage them in the first place to whistleblow if they sought advice, but also support that decision once they've made it. So that's really key, and that's really acting in our favour at the moment, which is, which is good. 
Um, and also acting in our favour if we're thinking about motivation from a reflective point of view, where someone would sit and rationalise the pros and the cons of this. Acting on our side at the moment and enabling people to come forward is their identity. So the way they perceive themselves as not just an athlete or a coach, but as a person. And whistleblowing is important to many people in this space. So they think it's important to their personal integrity to go through with this. Um, and they think it's their responsibility as an athlete and as a coach and as a, as a part of the community. It's their responsibility to ensure that things are better. So they feel confident to report mostly, even if others are maybe not willing to do so, and even if perhaps they're not being actively encouraged to do so, because their personal value is strong enough to drive them forward. Um, and that ultimately leads people to have a strong intention to do. That is fantastic because that's your uh, pre, kind of pre-rationalised plan. Like the plan is, most athletes and coaches will report. Unfortunately, that's not always how behaviour works. So we can have best laid plans and something can intervene with them. And that's where perhaps some of our other factors come in. So one of the things that was interesting is that people were optimistic generally about what would happen if they reported. They thought that it was fundamental to protect the right of athletes uh, to clean sport, to report. So always that ties back to their kind of identity and what it means to be an athlete. Um, but they were not as sure about what would actually happen. And again, this goes back to them needing some kind of feedback mechanism. Around 70% thought that an investigation would be conducted. So obviously that still leaves 30% unsure exactly if, if it's worthwhile. And even fewer, so 60 to 70 percent. I know obviously we're still operating in the majority, but we kind of got 30 to 40 percent of people here that are not convinced and not optimistic um, that sanctions will be imposed as a result. And the red, the red kind of um, dotted boxes, they were the perceived negative consequences. So going into this, we thought that coaches and athletes would pretty much see um, whistleblowing as resulting in quite a lot of negatives. Um, and some of the things we specifically asked them were about the, the way it might damage their relationships, the way it might damage their future potential as a coach or a sports person, and the harm it could essentially bring upon their sport. And interestingly, they were not that concerned about those things. Um, they were kind of five to 10% of people were concerned about some of them, maximum 20% were concerned about the others. But as Kelsey said earlier, they were more concerned about the other person involved in the situation and the damage that might happen to them rather than themselves personally, which is pretty fascinating. And from an emotional perspective, so this is more of thinking with the heart rather than thinking with the head, they were pretty strongly towards um, reporting. So they thought that they wouldn't regret going forward with information. They wouldn't feel guilty about that, and they didn't. They were, you know, they were not afraid of doing so. What was uh, maybe an issue is the fact they would feel anxious, and again, it comes back to the same factors that we've talked about already: is that it's that uncertainty around what if uh, the media become aware of this? Like, what if my identity is not protected? Um, and they really desperately wanted anonymity and confidentiality to be maintained. Um, so there's kind of 45% of the sample that anticipated being very anxious if they reported and only 50% thinking they would actually feel proud of themselves and again we think that's underpinned by the fact that they are essentially harming someone else even though they're um, protecting the, the greater population so you know it, they're really in a sticky situation. So just bringing it back to I suppose the theory all of the green things on there, we found out enabling people at the moment, and it's a lot more positive than you may have predicted. So there are a lot more factors in our favour encouraging whistleblowers to come forward at the moment. But there are some areas for improvement, and they're the ones that are highlighted there in yellow. So small piece around knowledge and skill, which is psychological capability, some reinforcement and emotional issues, they are our automatic motivation. And then this idea of the environment around us and the reaction that we may uh, experience, which is a combination of the physical and social opportunity. So in terms of what to do, you know, how do we address this? The interesting thing was that the findings of the survey really supported the findings of the interviews. Um, there was a lot of crossover in terms of how we would address the, the, the challenges. 
as it were. So obviously, first and foremost, we need to educate and train. We need people to be more aware of how and what they're reporting, uh, just at the most basic level, that's reaching the individuals. Um, but beyond that, we need to do a lot more in the social and, uh, and physical environment. So we need to be um, persuasive. That basically means drawing on people's emotional reactions um, to evoke action. And we need, desperately, environmental restructuring. And that is all about how we um, deal with whistleblowing as a culture. And that's not something that's specific to doping in sport. That's probably whistleblowing in a real wider context. Um, but certainly for whistleblowers on doping, um, the way that they are treated, the way they are supported through the process um, from organisations and from the wider uh, societal level is you know, something we really need to work on. And that's us done. So as Kelsey said, please, please come ask us for more information. This is a real snapshot into kind of quite a big project. So thank you. And I apologise for the technology. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laurie. I, I had maybe a question was, uh, why was it uh, um, limited to um, athletes and coaches? Was it uh, the whistling, uh, the, the research, why was it limited to athletes and coaches? Was it? Uh, Good question. Uh, Thank you. I guess basically we have to start somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there is very, very little research. Actually, Kelsey and another colleague of ours, there are only two published papers on whistleblowing sport at the time we started this okay. project. Um, there's now one more, mm -hmm. thanks to us. Um, but we just know so little about this behaviour. So, yeah. Great. So, uh, please uh, ask a question. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, Maybe away for the mic. I'm coming. Hello, thank you, everybody. So regarding the whistleblowing stuff, we're obviously seeing a lot of the same sentiment in match fixing. Um, this is where I did my research. Um, a lot of athletes don't know that it exists. In a lot of cases in our organizations, there isn't a line yet. But in the situations that there is one, the information is so buried. It's so hidden, and um, yeah, I, in my research with match fixing, we see a lot of the same mistakes and had a lot of this, some similar recommendations when it comes to the lines, and you know, it should be easy to find. I should be able to know what is it for? Is it for doping? Is it for sexual assault? Is it for match fixing? Who can use it? Can I use it as a coach, as a parent, as, a, as an athlete? Who's gonna answer it? It, a lot of the websites don't provide this information, and, and yeah, proof that it works. If I do this, you know, where's my where's my case going to go to? So what I wanted to ask you guys, looking at the doping stuff, have you been able to now successfully influence more proactive hotlines? Um, well, first of all, we sent this to water two weeks ago, so um, they haven't done anything yet, which is fair. Um, Yes and no. I mean, I guess for me personally, I now am stage sport, so that was a big part of why, kind of going on what you're saying with match fixing, like as, as we were doing this research in doping, stage sport was kind of exploding, and very quickly the overlaps were there. Obviously, I, I mean, I was watching match fixing as well, and so, you know, it, it doesn't, this is the first research that's been done in doping in sport. There's been a heck of a lot of research that's been done on whistleblowing in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and. But what was surprising is that it hadn't stopped and looked specifically at sport and accounted for some of the unique features of sport. Um, so yes, uh, the next phase, so one of the one of the things, the first phase of this project, we audited every existing anti-doping whistleblowing platform in the world um, at the international level, national level, and then even at the national governing body level in the US and UK, and identified all of the features and the next step it most likely will be that we'll, we'll be created a framework of now how to audit those um, for effectiveness and to identify gaps. Um, and so that will be the next step in that um, and, and kind of identifying like what's the minimum, like basically the must, the ideal and like the totally ideal yeah. scenario so that we can kind of have everybody at a baseline but then, you know, if you can aspire or afford to get to this point, do this and, and that. Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's really good. And I, one of the organizations I looked at was a, as a please. One of the organizations I was looking at was a, was an American 
national organization, and they had a hotline. Um, it was so buried that, like, I mean, I spent 20 minutes digging through governance materials to find it, and if we can't yeah. find it, an athlete sure as heck is not going to, but it was like really addressing only um, harassment, sexual abuse, but I mean, it's, it's mar it was advertised as an integrity hotline, and, and it's sending a lot of mixed messages. So what, like doping doesn't matter? We're not here to help you, match fixing doesn't matter? And this is really nice that, that you're, you're providing this tool because it's so needed because so many organizations have such a far way to go. Yeah, and what was interesting too is that when we did that audit, we then sent it back to every organization that we reviewed because we basically just did it as like if I was in the public looking this up, what would I find? Mm -hmm. And so we recorded like what do you like what instructions do you provide? What's the link? What are the different channels? Is it does it say secure or not on the website on the Google search? Which was interesting because when I went back to a number of the organizations, they were like, what? Like yeah. ours doesn't say secure. Um, and the idea was basically to say, if I was a lay person and I wanted to find out how to report, like, what do I see? Yeah. Um, and so that is, that's in the report, and that's actually been published already. That was published last year on WADA's website. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I think, I mean, I don't know how many, there's probably like 50 organizations in it, and it has, yeah, probably more than that. Um, the table includes, like, all of the details of what it has and what it hasn't, and the idea was also to help people see what other people have. Mm -hmm. So, like, and kind of tap into the competitiveness of sport, like, oh, shoot, that group has that many things, like, we need to up our game. And some actually had, when we sent it back out, a couple then <coughs> sent me back stuff, and we were like, add this, we added this, like, we're adding this. I think the thing to say on that as well is that how fast moving this has been. So whistleblowing hotlines and things, they, they only were just coming out, like, when we first started the yeah. project. And the really good thing about this was that WADA identified a need for this project because they brought out a framework and a policy document, pretty sure, and they also had established their line, but they didn't know if that was the right way to go. And so they essentially retrospectively asked us as a team to undertake some research that would help them move that framework forward. So one of the activities right at the end of the report, stage five, was mapping our recommendations against what WADA had initially created. And so, for instance, the persuasion, the education, the training, we went through their framework document and we identified where they had those elements of a program in place and the components that they didn't yet have in place. And so, for instance, one of the main things that is currently missing is the messaging around uh, being a whistleblower, what it means. So, if you think the way that the hotlines are currently marketed, it's kind of report doping a little bit like Crime Stoppers in the UK that we have. It's kind of like, you know, this is bad, report this. Um, and we need to really play on different messaging, yes. like um, in terms of that, that emotional consequence and the understanding and the empathy of what it means to be a whistleblower mm -hmm. and how conflicting making that decision may be before clicking on the link and kind of typing in someone's details. So that was one of the really good things is that yes, we only gave it to Wada kind of two weeks ago, but they will do something with it because. And that was actually something they asked. That wasn't part of it. We sent them the final report, and they were they immediately asked, yeah. "Can you add on an evaluation in comparison to like your recommendations compared to what we have now?" Which is why I got delayed. I have a question. Can I just ask a follow-up question? <laughs> uh, and it's for the questioner as well. And this is based on experience with them. Do you think that athletes and sports personnel should be under a positive duty to report? So therefore, if it comes out of the investigation, say in a team building, that yeah. teammates ought to have known what occurred, and they didn't abide by the duty of report, then they could be sanctioned. I think that's well. I think that's a really good question. My hesitation there, after doing this research, is that not enough people know how to report, mm -hmm. and so I think we have an obligation first as the organization and educators to make sure they know how to do it. And then we could consider the possibility of holding them accountable. But based on what we just did, like I would be super uncomfortable with us yeah. holding them accountable. But I think somewhere down the line, potentially yes. Yes, please. Uh, on, on this point, and in terms of the actual logistics, do you communicate with the athletes in a direct manner, or do you actually delegate responsibility to the relevant sporting governing bodies? Mm -hmm. so the point I'm trying to make is that the ball is going to be lost. To them. Uh, on the way at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think, so there is an expectation, like the complicity clause in the anti-doping rule violations now provides an expectation to report. So I think, I would like to think that at the like, more kind of international federation type level, like, they're pretty aware of that. Um, obviously, there's kind of some leniency as to where that lies, and it's not as straightforward as we would like it to be. 
Um, but I do think it, it, it can't be us. Like, us two are not going to educate the world on how to whistleblow. Plus, it's different in every country. Like, there's certain yeah. international ones, but there's also in ones within federations and national governing bodies and, and NATOs. And so I do think there's an organizational obligation, but I think if we can start at the top and trickle it down and then make sure that message is going through each of those webs, and then we have that accountability. Like, like I was saying, like in France, it's called délation, and délation is taboo. Yeah. So how, 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 how would you deal with that? I think for us, um, like exactly like Kelsey said, and like you said, every culture is different, every yes. context is different. And we would encourage everyone, any organization, to actually engage with a similar an analysis of their situation in terms mm -hmm. of the factors that would be most dominant. So these are the factors most dominant in our sample, probably representative of the UK and the US, but the other factors within that model, they could be a different balance in a different context, uh, and even at a different moment in time. So after a whistleblower kind of case kind of goes out publicly, it could change. Yes, because it's a bad word in French. It's about actually a bad word, you know? It's like you don't do it. You're like, yeah. And I think another piece that we didn't mention is so that, that survey that we created, we're, we're validating right now. So that yes. it could be used in every country. Obviously, it need to be validated in different languages, but so that you can get a sense of like, what does this look like within our community? Yes, because it's a question of moral. So moral is like, ethics is different per country. So yeah. it's like, what is valid and, you know, I'm not a sociologue, but yeah. no. No, that's so true. And I think there's some of those factors that we found were strong. Interestingly, even just across the UK and the US, yes. there were differences. So that commitment to clean sport with the identity of it being part that was actually stronger in the US than the UK. Uh, some of the other factors came through on, on the UK sample. And I think that obviously kind of really very briefly mentioned the problems with recruitment in the UK is that the reality is that coaches and athletes don't want to sometimes engage with our doping related research in the UK. Like we really struggle to get a sample together. And that I think speaks volumes. Whereas in the US, we usually get really good engagement from organizations and then they like, obviously advertise the project to their uh, members and we get really good engagement there too. And so I think even just between the UK and the US, there are big cultural differences. Yes, yes please, you had a question. And then, and then you. We also have one over there. Okay. Thank you, Monsieur, Monsieur and Madame. Thank you, Jesper Larsen from uh, anti doping Denmark. And that's the question that is for Howard and, and Gregory. You, you mentioned the, the, the desire to have more worldwide consistency in first uh, instance uh, decisions in, in uh, national anti doping panels, etc. And uh, you only very briefly, uh, Howard touched on the role of WADA in that respect. Uh, WADA has uh, the, the right to appeal every national first instant case. Uh, as a prosecutor in Denmark, I, I regularly consult with or seek advice from WADA's legal department. Uh, as, as you rightly mentioned, the uh, uh, panels don't uh, depend equally much on, on case law in different parts of the world. In our part of the world is one where they don't depend so much on case law. Uh, so, so I, I find this ad advice uh, from from Wana uh, useful in many in, in many cases. Also, maybe to avoid later on uh, an appeal from CAS on, on the national level. So I wonder, uh, because you only touched so briefly on, on, on the role of, of Wana in, in gaining this worldwide consistency, uh, if you could comment on that. Sure. I mean, of course, Wana has the the right to appeal any case. Um, I'm sure they do not desire to appeal every case. It's a resource issue, and and, um, and I think if you asked WADA, they would they would probably I've never asked them, but um, they would prefer that it be more harmonized. That they don't have to appeal because there are first instance tribunals that they feel are not following the code, and um, and and I think all of it, you know. It, there has to be a goal to have less appeals as a, as a starting premise. And if, the, if, you, if you accept that premise, then anything you can do to, in my opinion, harmonize so that the first instance tribunals are, are essentially all looking at the cases in a similar way is, is going to at least help in achieving that. Right. On that point, I'm allowed yes. you to say a few things. Uh, and just to continue what Howard is actually saying, 
Um, I don't think WADA, I agree, I don't think WADA wants to actually appeal every decision. And this is the essence of actually creating uh, harmonization at the national level because if there is consistency in the decision making, I think that will make uh, life a lot easier for WADA. And also, you have to remember that uh, a few years back, WADA didn't have uh, a right to appeal. And you remember that uh, that right began uh, some sort of acceleration as a result of the uh, case that involved the two Pakistani cricketers, and they're actually accused of uh, using a steroid. And the local authorities in Pakistan acquitted both of them. And because of the time in the regulatory framework, there was no right to appeal. What well, I just couldn't appeal that decision of gas. So they decided to actually incorporate that provision in the subsequent uh, water code. So it was, it was really born out of necessity, I would say. Can I, can I just add, pick up on one point about that? And it, so, for example, where are you? substance comes on or where the testing becomes more sensitive. So for example in Australia we've had a cluster of ligand troll type <laughs> tests. Ligand troll, it's a, a particular type of substance which a number of athletes have begun to test positive for. Um, and so we I know that Asada has looked to what USADA has done. And but there's one interesting issue about that is the availability of national anti doping uh, cases so that you can look around globally to see what, rather than having to rely on WADA and that, can, can we do it ourselves through our national anti-doping, uh, international anti-doping agency. So that, that is, there is definitely people looking at each other. Whether it's done in a coherent way is not an issue. Yeah, uh, Bill Bach, the general counsel of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. And um, Kelsey, we were pleased to have the opportunity to, to work with you. I recall when, when you came to us um, several years back to start your research project. And, um, and, and I, I think you're right on with everything that, that you're saying is consistent with, with, I think, our experience. We have um, had what we call our play clean line um, for more than a decade. And since about, I think it is about 2013, we've been keeping statistics, and I thought it would be interesting to share some of those. Um, we get about 700 tips a year um, on our Play Clean line. We get those in a variety of fashions. Some are anonymous, some are um, people want to call back, and we always do have somebody uh, call them back individually. Um, and, and to the reporting that you identified we have to, to work through, but we consider this to be one of the most important aspects of, of what we do in terms of changing the culture of sport, but also in terms of identifying cheating. Um, out of those, we've had many cases, um, probably 40, 30 to 40% of our cases are not analytical and those result from whistleblowing. And additionally, of the, um, the tests that we initiate, um, we found that our hit rate in terms of successful tests based on information from a whistleblower is over 10%. Whereas, um, it, where, based on just the, uh, a, a test distribution planning effort that doesn't involve that intelligence, it's less than 1%, so a half a percent. So whistleblowing is tremendously important in terms of identifying doping and, and being successful. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to... Um, can, can I ask Bill? I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah. I, I'm just curious if your perspective is so you get 700 tips a year. Do you view that as a high level of engagement or a low level of engagement or somewhere in the middle? Um, what, what we notice is the, the engagement varies depending on what happens in the media. When we have a big case, we get a lot more tips. When we um, have a positive case for a master of cyclist, we get a lot more tips from the master of cycling community. So it, it, it really is dependent upon the media. Is that a high level of engagement? Um, we haven't done some sort of statistical analysis. and. I'm hoping that maybe Kelsey and Lori could do that next. But, uh, and, We're asking. Yeah, and, and, and let us know. But 
but we see it as a, a tremendously important research resource and something that we want to encourage. So we do put in our press releases that um, that uh, when somebody uh, gives us substantial assistance and sometimes that it came from an investigation that, that resulted uh, or resulted from a tip because we think it's really important for people to know that, that their tips are making a difference and, and, and we want to encourage people to come talk to us. So we do categorize tips. Not every one means that we open a case or something and we have a, a system for doing that. But two, two other things real quickly, um, in, in terms of just getting a sense of what it's like to be a whistleblower, there's a recent podcast by Kara and Adam Goucher on the Clean Sport Collective that I would highly recommend um, giving insight into what it's like. And, and, you know, it's not all positive. Like, they, they, they give it to you about how difficult it was to wait for years for, for a decision. Um, so I think it's very, um, it's very real. Um, and then the last thing, um, I, there was a, a talk at the beginning about, you know, some people are concerned if they give it information that might ruin somebody's life. And then we talked about the confrontation alternative. And it's just my personal opinion that that, that might be asking people to do too much to, to confront. And it may be counterproductive in a variety of ways. But in terms of the concern about ruining somebody's life, I always like to take people back to the experience of people that have actually been through that. And we have a wealth of examples from the Gouchers to the Tyler Hamilton to many others who say it relieved a great weight off my shoulders. It improved my mental health. It improved my relationships with, with others who I couldn't really face because I felt badly about not having come forward and supported clean sport. So that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is you're talking about kids that are using drugs, that are cheating to get ahead. That's not a good basis for success in life. You're helping somebody, even if it's a difficult thing. It, I have not seen it ruined most people's lives. Now there, there are examples where it's, it's very, very difficult and we have to set up resources and support for people that are um, exposed as having cheated. And that's tremendously important. But, um, but actually I think we need to turn people to thinking that this could actually help people when, they're, uh, when it's brought out. Can I turn part of that into an actual question? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and no, in, in all seriousness, because the research is fascinating about all the reasons that people do not come forward. Um, you know, if it's, if it's people they know and all the different pressures. And it strikes me, and I'm curious if, if you've looked at this in your research at all. If, you know, you mentioned Tyler Hamilton. I, I think in doping, particularly. A lot of the people that have information are people that are, they have the information because they're around them, and so you are talking about turning in your friends, or even more, they have the information because they did do it. And, um, you know, how, so you have, you've talked about deterrence, but it seems to me that that's a gigantic deterrent. You know, if they're going to come forward and they have no idea what's going to happen to them. And I'm, I'm curious with how much you've looked into that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say about our recommendation, so uh, it kind of picks up on both points, but I'll speak to it briefly before Kelsey speaks. Um, that's where the persuasion piece comes in. So, like, one of the ways of um, helping enable whistleblower hymns would be persuasion, and that means doing things that evoke an emotional response and reassuring people how it will be. So, you know, we have lots of misconceptions as human beings. We catastrophize many things in life that you know, aren't as bad as we think they will be. But it's that um, that immediate kind of thought is that we think this will happen, even if it's unrealistic. So it's about communicating in ways that um, reassure people that this won't happen. And the best way to do it is to provide real examples. So all those success stories that we were talking about before, or not even just a success story, but an ex a real experience of a person that they can then think, okay, this is how it might be, it might not be, how I think it's going to be. Um, that's how we obviously need to work more. We need to work more on that. Okay. We have time, but it's, we have six minutes left. 
So we, I think we have time for two more questions. You and you, Mister. Maybe before you, and then we will finish with you, Mister. Women are great. Thanks. Casey Wallace, I'm the athlete ombudsman of the U.S. Olympic Comparative Committee. And I appreciate your research a lot. I think we're trying to figure out what role our office would play in whistleblowing. And, and my first question, it's a two-part question. One is, just after hearing Bill's numbers and statistics, does it make sense, based on your research, to have whistleblowing be issue-specific? So for anti-doping, to go to an anti-doping organization, safe sport, similarly. And then you also um, mentioned that there's there's four really critical things to get going here. And I'm curious if the role of a whistleblower advocate and someone who provides um, after whistleblowing support, should those all be in the same office or do you recommend those be issue specific or just your thoughts on the research? Yeah, so to the first question, um, I think it could go both ways. Personally, I took the role at USA Cycling because I think that they all fall under sporting integrity and athlete well-being. Uh, and in this role at USA Cycling, I am anti-doping and safe sport, so there's one person that they can go to for that. Um, that being said, I think that there's some really sensitive subjects and you don't necessarily want to just talk to the same person for all of it. I think having a male and a female option is important. Uh, especially if we're talking beyond anti-doping, things around sexual abuse, that kind of thing. I think it's really important that it's not just one gender. Um, I think that if you are to combine them under one, there has to be a clear indication that there's kind of experts or people with background in those different topics because yes, there, there's lots of similarities, especially on the actual act of whistleblowing or like the chant, like the functional part of it, but there's a lot of, there are some important differences in potentially the implications of that. Um, so I think, yes, it, they definitely can, and, and they fall under one overarching umbrella, but at the same time, it's important to have acknowledgement of the differences between them. Um, the second part of the question being um, who should provide that support, and should it be internal or external? I think in most situations, this conversation I've had a lot as well, like, it's resource dependent. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the support, like, I, wouldn't, I don't think there should be the person that's receiving the tip or the report is the same person that's offering like psych psychological support to them. There's going to be some stuff there that they're not going to want to talk about with the same person. So one, I definitely think that part of the unit needs to be independent, and and I would say that's kind of the advocacy piece of it. Of like, this is the person I can go to because a lot of it was, a lot of the things that came through was like uh, some of them know people that have blown the whistle, and so they would go to that person. I think there's a unique opportunity for us to use retired athletes and or whistleblow with like people that have blown the whistle because a lot of the ones that I've spoken to would love to offer support and guidance to somebody else considering coming forward. And so I think that doesn't mean that, you know, as soon as someone blows the whistle, we say, hey, can we sign up on a list of, like, you can support whistleblowers moving forward? No. But if we let people know, like the Clean Sport Collective, um, you know, Kara has been identified as someone that has blown the whistle. And, you know, there's someone there that we can now go to. We don't just automatically do that, but if she were to say, okay, I'd like to be someone that can offer support or guidance, you know, there's opportunities there. So I think the independence is important, especially in the anti-doping one and at the international level. Um, there's lots of trust issues, and rightly so, and so to... Okay. okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to put you there. <laughs> Because I really, really want to have time to have for the last. Well, I will be very short because I have a very practical uh, approach to this. If if I want to bring a proposal before our Congress about establishing a, a whistleblower um, possibility, I need to know that what I propose works. As president, you have only one shot. Otherwise, you would go before play the game conference in two years and. You didn't really want this to, to to work. So would it be for for football or soccer in Europe, or could we make it into the National Olympic Committee for all sports, 63? That's one thing. Is it the same for match fixing, doping, and corruption? Because we have only one shot, so we can't make it uh, for, for only one thing. And then the, there was the next thing. What, what, what way would, would be the most effective? The way to in, to to inform the the uh, athletes and so on, uh, so we can make sure 
that they really use this very expensive whistleblower possibility. So you make recommendations, but your wish list, it was hotline, online, portal, or personal uh, number and so on. I don't have that possibility. I have only one shot, so you have to tell me which one of them are best. I have more questions in a practical way. Can we start here? Well, it might be more than a bit. Not to default, but I would say that you should ask. You should ask your stakeholder groups, so that the people you expect to report, you should ask them what their preference would be, whether it's a mobile phone app, a text line, a, an online platform. But I would survey your stakeholder group, the ones that you want to use it. My advice would be we streamline how many exist. Uh, we looked at our anti doping audit as over 50 organizations. Why the heck do I need to report to 50 people? Um, I think that there is a, we talk about this in sport all the time, like we don't need more of the same. We need something, a clear way to go to it. Um, so I couldn't tell you, I, I'd be lying if I gave you one thing, I don't know your sport exactly. Um, I think that there is different nuances, but I don't think we need to keep replicating the wheel. I think we need to refine what's there and probably merge some of it. Thank you very much, everybody. We are in, in time uh, for Café Kuchen. And uh, uh, we had a beautiful um, panel. I learned a lot. Um, they kept their times. Uh, I think there would be to be uh, available at uh, coffee break to answer more questions. I certainly have a lot of questions for them, so I will come to you. Uh, we had a great audience, great questions, so thank you to the audience. Bravo. Merci beaucoup. Vous avez été super. J'espère que ça ne vous a pas dérangé que je ne parle pas en français. Thank you. So, see ya.